You will hear a woman phoning to inquire about exhibition information. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning. You're through to the events coordinator at the Birmingham City Council. How may I help you? Hello there. My husband and I are interested in purchasing tickets to the automobile exhibition, but I couldn't find many details about it on your website. And I was wondering whether you could provide me with some more information. Does it open in June? The purpose of calling is to purchase tickets, so purchasing has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Good morning. You're through to the events coordinator at the Birmingham City Council. How may I help you? Hello there. My husband and I are interested in purchasing tickets to the automobile exhibition, but I couldn't find many details about it on your website. And I was wondering whether you could provide me with some more information. Does it open in June? Yes, of course, madam. The exhibition will take place during July. And will showcase the history of automobiles from the very first commercial car in the late 1800s, all the way through to the present day. Is the exhibition open for the duration of July? No, madam. The exhibition will last three days, from the 1st of July to the 3rd of July, and then the cars will be taken to another exhibition. Okay. Does the exhibition focus on a certain manufacturer? No. It will showcase a wide range of manufacturers. Wonderful! I'm ever so fed up of going to these shows and only seeing one manufacturer. Are there any opportunities to sit in or even drive the cars? There will be many opportunities for you to sit in the cars. However, some of the cars will only be available to observe. We are yet to be told whether any of the antique cars will be available to drive. However, there will certainly be an opportunity to test driving some of the more modern cars on a purpose-built track. That sounds like great fun. I mustn't forget to bring my camera, or my husband will never forgive me. I'm afraid to say that cameras are actually strictly not allowed to bring into the exhibition. There will, however, be a section where a professional photographer will be available to take photos of you sitting in a car in period clothing. Well, that sounds like it could be fun, but I assume the photos won't be free. On the contrary, one free photograph is included within every ticket, but each photo after this will cost five pounds. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. That's a nice surprise. Not many things are free anymore. I've been asking around about the ticket prices, but I haven't yet had a definite answer. Is it correct that the tickets are one hundred pounds, whether you buy them now or on arrival? I'm afraid not. If you buy the ticket in advance, the price is a hundred and ten pounds. But it's a hundred and sixty-five pounds on the door. Oh goodness! I suppose I'd best pay for them now. Then, is it possible to buy tickets from you now over the phone? Yes, of course, madam. I'll transfer you to the box office manager, Mark Edgeworth. That's E D G E 
W O R T H. And he will probably need to take your credit card details and some personal details. Yes, that's fine. Before you transfer me, I just need to ask a few more questions. Will the exhibition be held in the Birmingham Exhibition Centre? I think that's where I went last time. No, madam. The Birmingham Exhibition Centre is currently undergoing some renovations, so this year all exhibitions will be held in the Summer Palace. Summer Palace? I'm not entirely sure where that is. Well, it's not too far from City Centre. Once you're in the centre, you should be able to find signs for the palace. If not, most people in Birmingham will be able to direct you. Mm, neither my husband nor I am particularly good with directions. Is there anywhere I can find this information on the internet? Our website will give you an address. Perhaps you could visit www.directions.com for more detailed information, and they should be able to provide you with step-by-step -step instructions. Okay. And is this the best way to contact you by phone? I think the most convenient way to contact us is inquiring online, which is much simpler than having to dial various different numbers to reach the right person. Unless you have any more questions, I'll transfer you now. No, that's great. Thank you for your help. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. You will hear part of a talk given by a member of staff at a hospital. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello and welcome to the homepage for the Healthy Hearing Medical Clinic and Surgery, where we'd like to share a little more information about the services we provide and more. Our hospital is one of the leading specialised hospitals in the United Kingdom attracting the very best healthcare professionals from around the globe. Not only are we a leading medical practice, but we are also the only hospital in the United Kingdom dedicated entirely to the treatment of and research into the curing of hearing loss. Our facilities and staff here are renowned across Europe, attracting thousands of patients a year. Our consultations can number anything up to 11,000 patients a year. However, we aim to treat around 5,000 patients a year so as to maintain and ensure the quality of our services. Our patients are guaranteed the highest standard of care, as well as the use of our first-class facilities. All patients requiring overnight treatment are provided with their own private room with ensuite facilities as well as a state-of-the-art entertainment centre, which includes a flat-screen LCD television and PlayStation. Appointments with our healthcare professionals can be made at any time during the week, with female doctors available between 8am and 11am. If you need to see a doctor outside of these times, please visit the Out of Hours page of our website for more information. Our doctors are all trained to an exceptionally high standard and practice a vast array of specialities. Mr. Roberts is a fully qualified ear and throat specialist. Mr. Edwards is a pediatric hearing specialist, while Mr. Green specializes in reversing hearing loss. 
For more details about our people, please visit the staff members page on our website. During a consultation, doctors will sometimes decide medication is required, for which patients should receive a prescription. There are several pharmacies within the city. However, we recommend that patients use the pharmacy housed within our healthcare facility. Our in-house pharmacy is well stocked at all times. Our products are competitively priced, and our pharmacists are on hand to help and advise from 8 a.m. until 10 p.m. from Monday to Saturday, and from 9 a.m. until 12 p.m. on Sundays. If you require any help outside of these hours, please see our Out of Hours page on the website. Since the Healthy Hearing Medical Clinic and Surgery also functions as a teaching hospital, we aim to provide our students with every opportunity to expose themselves to medicine in practice. Therefore, we would like to encourage our patients to give their consent for a medical student to attend their consultations. If our patients are not comfortable with this, there will be a form at reception where patients will be able to opt out. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, please look at the map I've given you of the Healthy Hearing Medical Clinic and Surgery. For those not familiar with our practice, reception can be found through the main door at the end of the corridor. If your consultation is booked with Mr. Green, you need to go through the main door and turn right by the nurse's desk and his office is at the end of the corridor on your left-hand side. If you need to alter any of your personal details, please visit our secretary at the Office for Medical Records, which you will find next to the therapy room. If you're awaiting surgery, please first check in with reception before taking the first door on the right after you enter the clinic. Finally, in the event that you feel disappointed with any of the services we have provided or have any further questions, please locate our manager's office, which can be found near the office for medical records and between two closets. If you have any more questions about the Healthy Hearing Medical Clinic and Surgery, please do not hesitate to contact us on 01256 111111. That is the end of section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 3. You will hear two business administration students, called Pam and Jason, discussing their project with their professor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. 
Hello, Pam, Jason. Thanks for coming to discuss your marketing project. I've read your proposal and outline, so let's go over it. Okay. Right. You've chosen the topic of food packaging. So, what did you want to get out of doing this project? We decided if we did our project on packaging, we might find some practical tips on how a business could make more money. After all, we're business admin students, and that's the ultimate reason we're on the course, isn't it? So, although we know the impact of packaging on the environment is important, we feel the government regulations are pretty strict already in that area. Okay. Now you've decided to look specifically at the packaging of food. What do you think the main issue is for shoppers these days? Some people get upset about the waste with all the plastic and stuff used to package food, but I guess most don't pay much attention to that. A few years ago, people seemed concerned about packaging food so that buyers knew more about what it contains from labels like calories, additives, and stuff. But in the current economic climate, Pam and I think people are most interested in packaging that helps keep food fresh for longer. And you've chosen to concentrate on big supermarket chains. Why not look at local stores or even convenience stores? Well, there are some interesting published studies based on small retail outlets, and we looked at those. But after a little investigation, we found that the managers of the large supermarkets in this area. Wanted to be helpful and are willing to let us talk to them and their employees. Of course, the supermarkets do account for most food sales around here, but that wasn't our reason for choosing them. Speaking of this area, you know the food buying choices here are quite unusual. Since we're in a university town, the population is quite young. But actually, my research shows that age isn't the factor in making the area unique. And although the education level is pretty high, that doesn't seem very important either. I guess it's because we got people from all over the world living here, with all the foreign students at university. That's it. Our supermarkets cater for a huge diversity of cultures. In our survey of the literature, I was struck by what shoppers say is most important to them when they buy. I would have thought how much the buyer had to pay would be the key. But that doesn't appear to be the case. That's right. How delicious the buyer considers the product seems to be the main thing. Whether or not the food is good for you is pretty low down on the customer's priorities. <laughs> That's interesting. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Let's discuss the practical experiment you're planning. You're going to design the box for a new breakfast cereal, which you'll try to market. Not in reality, of course, but by showing different designs to some of your fellow students on a computer, a kind of virtual reality supermarket, and the students will choose the design that appeals most. Let's talk through the experiment, okay? That'd be helpful. Now, the number of different designs you're proposing to show each student is two. If I were you, I'd make it at least four. That way, you can examine their reaction to more variety in the kinds of packaging. Okay, good idea. We do have several more designs. Now we've got a sample from our class of about twenty. Is that enough? Probably not. Try talking to the assistant in the business studies department. He can sort out how to recruit some more from other classes for you. Right. Now, as to how you're going to display your packages to the students, I did talk about those technical issues in one of your first classes. Go back and look over what I said about the practical realities of conducting experiments. Okay, we can do that. We're going to ask each student to choose the one design they think is best. But how will we know why they chose that one? Well, don't just rely on oral prompts. Give them a series of written questions. That way, you'll have hard data. Okay. 
But what about analyzing the data? Well, we've got an excellent computer program to gather it all together, but we still need to interpret it ourselves. So we'll need to give ourselves a few more days for that. <laughs> yes, we will. Anyway, it's all looking good. Now. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a talk on the history of football in Great Britain in the 19th century. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Great Britain is often hailed as the home of football, with talented players travelling from far and wide to play for teams in the English Premier League, one of the most popular football leagues on the planet. Today we are going to take a look back to the 19th century Great Britain in an attempt to trace the evolution of the beautiful game as it is now known. Prior to the 19th century, the game featured a wide variety of local and regional adaptations, which were later smartened up and made more uniform to create our modern-day sports of association football, rugby football, and Ireland's Gaelic football. Even up to the mid-19th century, Shrovetide football, or mob football, was still widely practised. According to the rules of mob football, there were no rules. A player could legally use any means whatsoever to obtain the ball, such as kicking, punching, biting and gouging, with the only exceptions being murder and manslaughter. These games may be regarded as the ancestors of modern codes of football, and by comparison with later models of football, they were chaotic and had few cooperation. Towards the latter end of the 19th century, and moving into the early part of the 20th century, however, there appeared a newfound emphasis on moral values in football. Perhaps a more modern example of this can be seen in John Terry's suspension as England captain, following reports of his infidelity to his wife. Furthermore, as mob football died away, there grew a greater concern for players' health and general well-being, with many clubs affording their top players access to frequent medical checkups and treatment. Despite the presence of Great Britain's unique, state-funded National Health Service, football clubs are still seen today, providing team members with state-of-the-art healthcare facilities, with the top clubs even housing their own specialist doctors and physicians. Today, football is a key feature of school children's day-to-day -day education, particularly for boys. With the help of football associations, all schools in the UK are boasting their own football teams. This mainly comes as a result of pressure put on schools and the government by concerned parents, who felt that football education taught their children valuable lessons and indeed vital life skills, such as teamwork, 
and a drive to succeed. Nowadays, many of the UK's top football clubs provide training facilities and outreach programs in an attempt to educate the nation's aspiring youths. As I previously mentioned, it was only during the 19th century that football, in its uniform concept, truly began to emerge. With footballers previously playing according to their own versions of the rules. However, it was not until the early 20th century that different players actually began to play according to these standardized rules. Prior to the 19th century, football was played by all the major English public schools, including the likes of Eton College, Winchester College, and Harrow. In 1848, there was a meeting at Cambridge University in an attempt to lay down the laws of football. Present at the meeting were representatives of each of these major public schools, whom each brought a copy of the rules enforced by their own individual school's rules of football. The result of the meeting was what is now known as the Cambridge Rules, thereby uniting the rules from across the country into one simple document. However, the Cambridge Rules were not liked by all, and a new set of rules, Thring's Rules, compounded in the book The Simplest Game, became commonplace among dissenters. Across the country, improvements in infrastructure and public transport had a knock-on effect of dramatically increasing attendance to football games. Football quickly became a social event where spectators would meet friends, drink tea and chat about the good old days. As football became more and more popular, it was decided that more money should be invested in maintaining the quality of pitches amongst other things and there was even talk of installing seating for spectators. However, the question of who was to foot the bill quickly became a divisive issue, with many believing that the government should fund football's development as a national sport. But in the end, the onus fell upon Britain's local and regional football clubs for the funding and development of the Football Association. They became responsible for the upkeep of football grounds, began to pay their best players a small salary, and organised competitions against other local and regional teams. And there began England's Football Association, or the FA, as we know it in its current form, the governing body of football in England. As the FA continued to grow and accumulate greater wealth, it was able to attract more and more talented young men from across the country, before finally accepting professional talent in the early 20th century. Today, football is played at a professional level all over the world. Millions of people regularly go to football stadiums to follow their favourite teams, while billions more watch the game on television or on the internet. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.